Nudge theory is a term that's used to describe the fact that if you create environments, particularly small micro environments, in such a way that things are easy to do, that humans will take the easy option. The term was popularised in a book published um, several years ago called Nudge by Thaler and Sunstein, which outlined the idea that if, if, this, um, if, if we face uh, easy options, we would choose easy options. That was then taken up by a number of public health uh, uh, activists, practitioners, politicians, who suggested, well, surely if we could make healthy choices easier, the easy ones for people to take, by altering the environment in some kind of way, they will. So things like uh, putting healthier foods at the front of um, canteen displays, um, getting rid of the sorts of things that make you want to buy the chocolates in the supermarket, you would nudge people to take, to take the healthier options. Actually, it's a very old idea. It goes back to the origins of psychology, um, when psychologists tried to understand the way that human beings simply respond to their environment. Nudge is not a new idea, but it picks up on the notion that we respond automatically to things um, in our environments, and if those environments are cued in such a way that they are healthy, we'll do the healthy thing. The, the use of, it wasn't called nudge of course, but the use of techniques to manipulate us, to buy stuff in particular in retail, has been around forever. Mm. Um, it, writers were describing this uh, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, and the layout of shops very carefully thought about, um, the way that a supermarket is laid out, where the products are, and in particular uh, the idea of having chocolates and sweets as you're lining up to pay um, to encourage you to buy them. It's been with us for a long time. Mm. The interesting question, of course, is it's clearly possible to nudge people to make purchases in a supermarket. It's clearly possible to nudge people to buy things as they're queuing up uh, to pay. But decisions in health, such things as um, deciding not to smoke, going on a diet and keeping on a diet, altering your drinking patterns or changing your physical activity are rather more complicated decisions than whether to buy a bar of chocolate or a bottle of wine or something like that. So the key question is, can you apply nudge in public health? And I think the answer is we don't really know yet. The jury's still out. Most of the evidence, such as it is, is about microenvironments and particularly food-based environments and drinking-based environments um, that has been a, where the idea of nudge and choice architecture has been applied specifically. But there's a much broader canvas on which nudge might work, and in particular the way that physical environments are built, are structured, um, with, to make them, for example, easier to walk in, to make them easier to cycle in, make them easier generally to do exercise of all kinds. Um, and we know um, from studies of things like the way stairs are sighted in buildings, how easy they are to use as against elevators um, and escalators, um, that people will walk more. So there is a whole thing about total systems from building construction um, to the way that um, cities are designed. Uh, some cities are easy places to walk, to run, to cycle. Others are almost impossible to do those things. And so we have to think about that, that broader canvas um, of a, a system-wide approach to uh, behaviour and behaviour change and encouraging those things which are the healthy options for us to do. Nudge and the behaviour change which it may or may not induce is one part and probably a relatively small part of a much larger armoury that needs to be brought in place if you are going to bring about major change. The example which illustrates this better than anything is tobacco. Um, 60 or 70 years ago, certainly when I was a child, um, I grew up in an environment where cigarette smoke was everywhere. Um, it was not many years from the publication of the first paper, which is 1952, which unequivocally demonstrates the relationship between exposure to cigarette smoke and lung cancer. We've been very successful in bringing down the numbers of smokers in populations here in Australia, but also the United Kingdom, the USA, Canada, and so on. And the reason for that is not because of one thing, and it certainly wasn't because of the publication of one paper. It was the fact that there was a multi-level, multi-pronged approach which involved everyone from governments 
down to individuals. It involved legislation, taxation, it has involved the ban on smoking in public places, and here in Australia now the um, plain packaging of cigarettes. Um, and all of that taken together along with massive health education and mass changes in knowledge and understanding of the risks associated with tobacco that has brought about this extraordinary public health success. That wasn't achieved by nudging people, though when you go somewhere and you want to smoke and you can't because the environment doesn't permit it, you're nudging people not to smoke. Um, so when we're thinking about these other things, with non-communicable diseases associated with obesity, um, associated with lack of physical activity, associated with overconsumption of alcohol, we again have to think about a multi-pronged, multi-level approach. And even with the great success in tobacco, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it was 1952 when Dolan Hill published the first paper. And certainly in the United Kingdom, we didn't get the ban on smoking uh, in public places for nearly six decades. It takes a long time. There's no quick and simple solution. <laughs>